Okay, we're going to continue with the lecture number four on the necessity of scripture. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we're going to go straight into Q&A. Uh, we've got a few questions to go through. Um, so we will see how much we can cover during the question and answer uh, session. And then after that, we're going to read the Bible. Uh, and uh, Dr. Carson will uh, preach to us again from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, hopefully we will end uh, on time at the quarter past one. So that's the plan for the rest of this morning. Uh, we, so we still got a fair bit to cover. So can I just uh, invite now uh, Dr. Carson to come forward to continue with the next lecture. Thank you. Now in this session, I've been asked to talk about preaching God's necessary word. That probably needs a word of explanation. Uh, as far as I can see, it's also tied to what is often called the doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture. Let me explain. My sister worked for a while as a missionary in Papua New Guinea in a tribe that was pre-Stone Age in its technology. That is, it, it did not even use stones for its ax heads or knives and so on. It used hardwood like teak on bamboo shafts. So technologically, it was pretty primitive. And this tribe still had no Bible. Um, this was 40 years ago. And, and yet some of them had become Christians. They told stories from the Bible and one or two people who could read related languages, read related language Bible stories and then tried to explain them the best they could. It was a pretty simplified approach to things. But it shows that it was possible to have a nascent Christian church without a Bible. Now, in point of fact, translators were working on the Bible, but it's possible. That is to say, it's not the Bible as a book that saves people. It's the message of the Bible, the gospel that the Bible articulates that saves people. But what is also clear is that the message itself won't root itself, it won't transform the people deeply unless it becomes a book in their context which people can read and teach and see for themselves. Um, I have a dear friend, a former student. He graduated from Trinity 35 years ago. Um, his wife was my secretary at one point. They've been in Papua New Guinea among the Arab peoples now for 30 or 35 years, a long time. And they're working in 13 related languages. And almost every month or two months, there's another, another part of Holy Scripture that's been, been printed up as they've gone through all the processes of checking and counter-checking and, and so on, with a lot of um, uh, tribal translators now helping out. They sit around a big table and work on 10, 11, 12, 13 languages at once that are related, that are family related. And, and the stories they, they tell with pictures and videos of, of what happens when, when, when one of these churches gets their first copies of First Thessalonians or their first copies of Mark or whatever. The people, some of them have already begun to learn the language to, in order to read it. They've had to be taught an alphabet and taught to read their own language. And then others who have become good readers in their own language, they stand up and they read the text publicly for everybody. And inevitably you get comments like this. 
now God is speaking to me in my own language. And you realize that at this juncture, as the whole Bible becomes available, the life of the Christian community in those tribes is going to change. Because you cannot have an enduring, ongoing Christian community without the Bible. The Bible is needed. In the English language, William Tyndale was the first systematic Bible translator. And he was pursued until he was finally martyred, burned to death at the stake in Holland. But his aim was to translate the whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, and his vow was, in his own words, to make a plowboy that is somebody who's plowing a field behind a horse or an ox to make a plowboy more knowledgeable in Holy Scripture than the prelates of England. How far off can people go where there's an open Bible that is correcting errors, that is challenging people to learn and read by themselves? Do you, do you, do you, do you see? It really is important. At the time of the Reformation, the so-called sufficiency of scripture became one of the great debating points. Let me explain what was going on and, um, and show how this t gets tied to the necessity of scripture. In medieval Roman Catholic theology, and still officially it's the case today too, although sometimes it's not observed, but in official Roman Catholic theology, the Bible has a different role than it does in Protestantism. God, in Catholic theology, has given a deposit of revelation to the church. He's given a deposit of revelation that includes the Bible, but it includes tradition that has been confided to the magisterium. So the magisterium is not only the official interpreter of the Bible, but is also the conveyor of revelation that has been confided to the church. So it's not that the Bible stands over against interpretation. Rather, it's that a block of revelation has been confided to the church, which ultimately means the Episcopal orders, the Episcopal characters, which includes the Bible and this oral tradition that has been validated by the higher levels of the magisterium. Over against that, the Protestants were saying, you can show that the oral tradition has changed and got modified with time. The Bible is, is stable. And, and there are biblical and theological reasons for thinking that the ultimate authority, the final authority, is the Bible itself. The Bible is sufficient. In other words, you don't need the Bible plus something else in order to establish your authority line. Now, obviously, you have to ask what the purpose is. For example, do you need more than the Bible in order to study nuclear physics? Well, well transparently, the, the Bible is, 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 is not given in order to make you a, a nuclear physicist. Do, do you need more than the Bible in order to uh, teach you integral calculus? Well, tr tr transparently, the Bible is not given to, to do. But to speak of the sufficiency of Scripture is saying something like, the Bible is sufficient in and of itself without other claims for putative authority to teach people how to be saved, to display the knowledge of God as God has disclosed himself in redemptive history and supremely in the person and death and resurrection of his Son to ground the object of our faith in Christ Jesus himself and to prepare us for home and glory. You don't need something else. The Bible is sufficient. But if the Bible is sufficient and anything else that is put on the same par with the Bible 
tends to have historically the long-term effect of domesticating the Bible, then you start seeing why Protestantism has always put a huge emphasis on the Bible itself. We're a Bible people because it's the word of God alone that has the final authority in these matters. It's not that we don't learn anything from tradition. If you're reading commentaries, then you're reading something in the tradition. But just because you're reading a commentary by Wesley or by Calvin or by John Chrysostom or by Augustine, you don't have the right to say, well, the Bible seems to say one thing, Augustine says another thing. I, I guess I'll choose Augustine. In, in other words, when you're reading commentaries, you're reading the voices of people who have tried to understand the Bible before you. That's fine, that's fine. But the authority lies not in Augustine or Calvin or anybody else, but in the Bible itself. That's the sufficiency of scripture. But where you have the scripture's sufficiency understood and believed, there also implicitly you are affirming the Bible's necessity. If the scripture is sufficient for teaching us about Christ and sufficient for teaching us about the church and sufficient for establishing our order of uh, structure and so on, our confessionalism and so on, then clearly it's necessary to have that which alone is sufficient. And thus the necessity of scripture and the sufficiency of scripture get very quickly tied together. Now before we think through a handful of practical matters on this, I'm going to spend most of my time in a slightly abbreviated session this morning directing your attention to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Verses 14 to 20. Let me begin by reading Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20. The setting is Moses addressing the covenant people of God before he dies and they enter the promised land. And he foresees a time when there will be a king in Israel. There isn't one at this stage. We read, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. So the question to ask, according to this passage, is what is the first priority of a new king in Israel? What's his first obligation? What's his first duty? Well, you begin by articulating what is not first. There are certain things he must not do, and it's worth surveying some of those. The time will come when there will be a desire to have a king over Israel. And, and part of the desire is, is clearly crooked. Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. <laughs> 
That is, part of the desire is to be like the pagans. And in the actual accounts in 1 Samuel, we recognize that some of the desire for a king, the clamor for a king was precisely that. But if you're going to have a king, get certain things in place. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses, verse 15. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. That is, he must not be a caretaker king from elsewhere or a king that makes you just a vassal state. At the time of the Lord Jesus, there was a king under Caesar called Herod. And Herod was a half-breed. He was not an Israelite. He was not really a confessional Jew. He, he was a compromise figure uh, who was appointed because he managed to pull the right political strings in Rome. He should not have been recognized. But in particular, what must he not do? Number one, he must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself. What's that got to do with us today? You must recognize that in the warfare of the time, a great number of horses meant a great number of tanks. That is, there were not only foot soldiers, what we would call infantry, but there were horses that could pull chariots with huge knives on their wheels, a bowman or two in the chariot, so that they could fire arrows from a moving chariot that could scythe its way through a group of infantrymen. So if you could field a force of 2,000 chariots, it would take a really big counterforce to overcome it. We're told here that he must not make himself rich in horses. In other words, he must not finally rely on military strength. His confidence when he looks at the world around him must not be send in the Marines. Both in the Old Testament and in the New, there's a place for a military. The problem is that there is also a danger that you want to have more and more and more military so that your identity, your strength, your perception of your importance in the sphere of things is your military. Just as you might want to build up your reputation by being most fabulously wealthy. But in the first instance, he must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you you are not to go back that way again. That is, you must not make the sorts of networking relationships that compromise you the people came out of Egypt. If they have to go down to Egypt to get more horses, then they're developing relationships that will compromise them. The people of Israel were supposed to be separated unto God. They are distinctive. And that becomes even clearer yet when we're told you are not to take many wives. Now, the the gathering of many wives in the ancient world was especially restricted to the rich, to the wealthy, and to the rulers. Today in Africa, when I visit Africa, if in most tribes, in most villages, men only have one wife, sometimes two or three, occasionally four in Muslim circles, but mostly one, unless you're the chief. If you're the chief and a Muslim, in Africa, it's pretty common to have two, three, four wives. And it was a mark, thus, of your superiority, your seniority amongst the other tribal people. And some of that happened in Israel, too, but it was more than that. Marriages were often arranged with political overtones. When you speak of kings in the Eastern Mediterranean a thousand years before Christ, these kings were often the equivalent today of our small town mayors. That is, there was a king of Ashkelon and a king of Gaza and a, and a king of Jezreel and so on. And all of these were cities, 
well, by cities, we don't mean KL with greater KL having, what, 8 million people? Or local KL having 2 million people? The average city in the ancient world had maybe 5,000 people. But it had its king, we would say small town mayor, its own troops and so on. And these various kingdoms would then link together as in Genesis 14, for example, where, where four kings battle five kings with a total of a few hundred troops on each side, you see, and, 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 and come to some sort of skirmish. But if you wanted some peace, what you did was marry the daughter of the king of the next town. So there's dear old Solomon with a thousand wives and concubines. That would keep you busy. But it was not just sex. It was also a signal of how important I am. And even more, it was a way of building a small empire because you're marrying all those princesses, which means it's unlikely that their daddies are going to rebel against you since after all, the you against whom he would be rebelling is married to one of my daughters. So all of these things mean not only that the king in question is compromising what God said originally about marriage. As Jesus puts it in the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, marriage was between one man and one woman. It's not only compromising that, but it's promoting an image of himself that is macho, an image of himself that lives beyond the moral constraints of lesser men. And worse, it's tempting him ultimately to turn aside from exclusive love for God. Eventually, Solomon, who is to be credited, humanly speaking, with building the temple in Jerusalem, also builds pagan temples in Jerusalem for his wives. What sort of compromise is that? For the sake of having a little more sex and sending out signals about how important I am, you're actually building pagan temples. What does the text say? He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. It doesn't just mean led astray with compromised views of marriage, but led astray with compromised views of the covenant. Led astray from faithfulness to God. It's marrying together not only covenant religion, but also paganism in the same small country. Not only so, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. That is, he must not make himself into a potentate of power through money. Those are all the things he's not supposed to do. And what is he supposed to do? Well, there's basically one thing that's mentioned with several reasons. There's one thing that he's supposed to do. It's his first priority. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is with him. It is to be with him. And he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to serve the Lord and so on. So he comes to the throne. What's the first thing he's going to do? Audit the books of his predecessor? Nope. Appoint a cabinet? Nope. Consult the official politicos with power and wisdom and experience? Nope. What's the first thing he's supposed to do? He's supposed to pick up a copy of this law. Now, what this law is referring to, whether it's referring just to the book of Deuteronomy or to the Pentateuch, it's not quite clear. But whatever it is, it's a substantial section. Perhaps it's the book of Deuteronomy. Maybe it's all of the Pentateuch. He's supposed to pick up a copy of it that's kept in the treasures secured by the priests and the Levites. And he's to make his own copy. Now, that doesn't mean he takes it to a copy machine. Xerox hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Nor does it mean he's supposed to download it from the cloud. 
so that it goes into his hard drive without passing through anybody's brain. No, he's supposed to take a scroll. Now, in the ancient world, scrolls were made either of papyrus or sheepskin. The expensive ones were sheepskin. Papyrus was a bit like rhubarb or celery. It's sort of stringy, and its profile was triangular. So you'd cut a stick of papyrus and nick the end of it and pull off a strip. Then nick the end of it and pull off another strip. You'd lay the strips out together until you made roughly a square. And then you'd cut off some more strips and put them out horizontally on the other strips and mash them together with some sort of organic glue and let them dry. And you had one piece of papyrus paper. Then you made another piece of papyrus paper. Then another piece of papyrus paper. You either glued or sewed them together until you had a scroll about 30 to 35 feet long. Then it was considered long enough and you started another one. That meant that if you were writing on one side, all the strips were going left and right. And if you were writing on the other side, the strips were going up and down. Now, if you're writing in Hebrew, you're writing from right to left. Greek and English goes from left to right. But Hebrew goes from right to left, like all of the um, Semitic languages. And so, um, you preferred to write on only one side. You preferred to write on the sides where all the strips are going left to right. So you, your, your stylus is not going over all the bumps that you go to on the back. Do you, do you remember how in the book of Revelation, um, God has in his right hand, the, th the hand of authority, a scroll written inside and out? Well, in a book like this, this is a codex form of book where it's sewn or glued on one side. Inside and out is a big difference. There's a lot you can write inside. On out, there's not much space. But in a scroll, there's as much space outside as there is inside. So writing inside and outside shows that it's, 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 it's got a lot of material there. Now, normally, you didn't write on the outside because whether in Greek, which goes from left to right, or in Hebrew, from right to left, if you're writing on the inside, your stylus can keep within the little piece of papyrus. But if you're writing on the outside, it's really a little bit rough because it's bumping over all the bumps, do you, do you see? So you, you tended not to do it. There were two circumstances under which you would write on the inside and the outside. Number one, if for some reason you wanted all you had to say in one place, you didn't want it to be divided between two scrolls, or number two, you were too poor to buy another scroll. Now in Revelation 5, you can't imagine that God is too poor to buy another <laughs> scroll. So it becomes a symbolism, a symbol-laden way of saying God has all of his purposes in blessing and judgment, all of them, all put together in one place which are going to be enacted when someone is found who can take the scroll and break the seals. You see, that's all background of symbolism because of the writing passages in the Old Testament. So now what's the king supposed to do? He's supposed to take a scroll and he's supposed to start copying out the law in his own hand, in Hebrew, from right to left. This verse and the next verse and the verse after that. And he can't do it quickly and messily. He's got to be doing it so clearly that it becomes his own reading copy. That's what the text says. Did you notice that? He's to copy this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life. So if he wants to have his own copy of the Bible, he can't go down to the shop and buy one. He's got to copy his own. His first order of responsibility once he becomes king, the first thing he must do is make a copy of his own Bible. Even if it only means Deuteronomy as opposed to the Pentateuch, it's going to take him a few days. It might take him weeks, but that's his first job. And it's followed up by a related job, namely to have his devotions out of it daily. That's a modern paraphrase. But it's exactly right, isn't it? He's reading the Bible daily so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and so forth. 
he is to read it all the days of his life. <clears throat> Isn't that remarkable? He's got all these royal executive jobs to do, all the things he must accomplish, all the administrative details that have to be secured, to appoint the right military officers at the border posts, to secure the frontier, to handle the politics, balance the books. But his first job is to make a copy of the Bible and then read it every day. That's a spectacular instance of the necessity of the Word of God. And God gives some reasons for this priority in the king's life. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life. Number one, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God. One of the things that faithful Bible reading will teach you is to revere God. Oh, it's possible if you're cynical enough to read the Bible and not revere God, just to become a cynical smart mouth, it's possible. But for most believers, one of the things that keeps you keen to revere the Lord God is to keep reading the Bible. I know a pastor a number of years ago who preached in French Canada and he got into an affair in the church. Nobody knew. But you could at least say this for him, that he kept reading his Bible. And as he kept reading his Bible, he began to think through the wrath of God. He got a concordance and looked up every single passage in the Bible that talked about infidelity and adultery and faithlessness. Until he was so convicted by his own sin that he went to his elders and confessed his sin and resigned. I think it's more common if somebody's going to fall into sin like that to stop reading the Bible. In the fly leaf of his Bible, Jonathan Edwards wrote the words, either this book will keep me from sin or sin will keep me from this book. It's not that the book is a magic book and if you read the Bible, you're guaranteed to be sinless. But if you keep reading the Bible, you will learn to revere God. One of the greatest helps toward reverence for God, toward the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, is reading the Bible. And presumably that means more than reading a verse a day, a verse a day to keep the devil away. which is treating the Bible again like a magic book. It means seriously reading the Bible. It'll teach you reverence for God. I, I know one of the greatest sins of pastors in this regard. They begin to think after a while, I don't need to read the Bible because I'm in the Bible all the time for my study and my preparation for next week's sermon and my Wednesday night prayer meeting and on and on. I don't need to read the Bible myself because, because I'm in the Bible all the time and I studied it when I was seminary. I know all that. Let me tell you what you'll lose first. Your reverence for God. You become a technician, that's it. Just a technician, a textual technician. Repent. So in the first place, it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God. That's number one. Number two, and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. 
In other words, how is he going to be faithful to obey scripture if he doesn't know scripture? So you want not only ministers, but churches that are full of the knowledge of Holy Scripture. That's the need of Scripture. That's the necessity of Scripture. How do you get people who are faithful to the covenant if they don't know what the covenant says? Then number three, not only follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, verse 19, but verse 20, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. That is to say, regular reading of the Bible will cut down on your arrogance. Whether you're president of a big company or you're the principal of a significant school or you're the pastor of a large church, any leadership position has the potential for making you arrogant. It doesn't have to, but it has the potential for making you arrogant. So now you're going to be king in Israel. Boy, there's some potential for being arrogant. How are you gonna cut that down? Well, copy out the Bible and read it every day. That'll trim your arrogance. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his people in Israel. So that's the necessity of scripture. Necessity because it teaches us what God says and thinks. Necessity because it teaches us what the terms of the stipulated covenant are. Necessity because that's what's needed to trim our arrogance. Necessity because that's leading us to read God's redemptive plan that runs right through scripture and finds its fulfillment finally in Jesus Christ. Do you, do you see? You might presuppose all of those things in a general sort of way, but the only thing that's going to keep you at the top end in all of those things is Bible reading and more largely Bible teaching and Bible preaching. I have learned something after teaching for 40 or 50 years. What I've learned is my students don't learn most of what I teach them. <laughs> and if you're a preacher, they won't listen to most of what you've taught them either. Or they'll listen. I don't mean, I mean they won't learn it. What will they learn from me? they will tend to learn what I'm most excited about. So if I become blasé about the gospel, if the gospel is simply something that I assume, but what really excites me is cultural analysis, if what really excites me is sociological statistics, if what really excites me is the political implications of all of this, and I assume the gospel, and assume the covenant, and assume the content of scripture, but what excites me, what I pass on in terms of excitement to my students, is something that's relatively on the periphery from God's perspective, then I will make that peripheral matter their center. because students won't learn everything I know or even everything I teach. What they'll learn is what I'm excited about. And the same is true in the context of the local church. If you assume the gospel but never articulate it, if you assume biblical content but never preach it, then what they will learn is whatever it is you're excited about. Denominational power, a certain kind of program. You, you see, at the end of the day, it's not simply what you say, but what you're excited about that shapes the next generation. So you must guard your own heart and work away at your own spirit so that what you're excited about, what gets you out of bed in the morning, is what is most central. God has said, 
This is the word of the Lord. The centrality of scripture and scriptural thinking to shape everything in my life and heart. And above all, will that be true of the gospel, which is at the center of the Bible storyline, with the Old Testament running off its tendrils to come to fulfillment in Christ Jesus, and the outflow from Christ and his person and his teaching and his death and his resurrection, his exaltation, his ascension to God's right hand, his session at the Father's majesty, where he reigns and promises and works and rules until he comes at the end of the age, all of which is spelled out in God's most holy word. If that's what makes you excited, that's what your church will learn. And the best way of accomplishing that, the way that is most fruitful, the way that is presupposed, the way that is exemplified in scripture itself is by making the scriptures the central place in the life and thought and teaching and reformation and worship of the local church. That's the necessity of scripture. Now we're going to stop there, so there's, we're still more or less on schedule, and uh, take some questions which I think Brother K. Ho will pose. Are we back on time now? Yes. Thank you, Don. Uh, indeed, we are right back on schedule, uh, but more importantly, thank you for highlighting to us uh, the necessary implications of the sufficiency of Scripture. Um, and you reminded me that we are all very busy, but I guess at the end of the day, we will always make time. We always have time for the things which are most important to us. And so if we start to say things like, I don't have enough time for this and all that, it actually reflects what I truly think about that matter, isn't it? Um, okay, we're going to continue with Q&A time. Uh, since, this, since I last showed you the questions that we have, we have had three times extra questions that has come in since then. So uh, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is that we're going to categorize uh, the questions into three categories. Uh, firstly, are questions concerning the doctrine of Scripture and its implications. Second, are questions concerning expository preaching, uh, both in terms of what that is and uh, what are the implications for the preacher and his preparation. And then thirdly, some other questions which are all arisen from whether the, uh, the talks, uh, the exposition that you gave and other, other things which are related. Okay, we'll see how we go with time and uh, because uh, we do want to ensure that we also make time for the preaching of God's word which will conclude our session today. So, let's go right in with the first question. Um, in the light of what you have said about scripture, is there still place for miracles? especially apostolic gifts like tongues, prophecy, and healing to authenticate our gospel message? There are certainly some Christians who think that the so-called sign gifts, which is what these are often called, have come to an end with the end of the apostolic age. I think that is a mistake. I don't think they have come to an end. On the other hand, the same scriptures that talk about sign gifts that serve in the life and ministry of Jesus and the life and ministry of Paul um, 
uh, as, as some sort of supportive authentication, um, also warn against them. So it's important to get the balance right. Um, you wicked and adulterous generation, how long shall I be with you? You look for signs and, 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 and miracles, but you do not pursue uh, righteousness and peace. Um, Jesus can be pretty blisteringly negative about these things. Um, so, 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 so as soon as a person starts demanding signs as authentication, um, you, you have to ask yourself, what part of scripture are you looking at? Because there are parts of scripture that warn against the love of signs. Uh, and Jesus himself um, is, is hanging from the cross and people are saying, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross and we will believe you. He, that would have been a whale of a sign. But he doesn't. He, he stays on the cross. And part of Christian experience and, and, and authenticness, authenticity, is that we take up our cross and follow Jesus. That's, that, that too is a, is a sign. So I have no doubt that God can and sometimes does perform miracles, but as soon as people start treating them as things that we control, that if we get our prayers right or we wangle things enough, um, God's got to owe us uh, something, then we forget that um, the Apostle Paul says, Tremus, uh, 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 what's his name? No, where he says, have I left behind in Troas sick? Um, I still haven't heard. Trophimus, that's right. Oh. Trophimus, have I left behind sick? So presumably, um, uh, the apostle Paul prayed for dear old Trophimus. He didn't say, oh, I'm not gonna bother praying for you, you can stay there sick. Uh, <laughs> But, but he, he does pray for him as he prays for everybody and, and, and yet Trophimus isn't healed. And Paul doesn't treat that as extraordinary. Whoops, failed on that one. Um, so, so, so I have no doubt that God in his great mercy uh, can do some spectacular things. Uh, but, but, but they shouldn't be treated as domesticated things. Um, is, this, is this being recorded? Yes? Shut off the recording. Just for a minute. Yeah. Okay, we can we do that? that? Okay, edit, edit what I'm going to say. Yeah. Um, By the way, I do have to apologize. I mean, I know questions are still coming in, but uh, we will not be able to address all the uh, questions. Um, um, still on clarity of scripture, how should we apply the clarity of scripture for issues with lesser clarity? For example, differences in denominations, church governance, baptism, etc. Just, just do what I do. No, no, no. I can see that you saw that was a joke. See, the, the, let me reiterate again something I did say in the talk. The clarity of Scripture does not claim that every part of Scripture is equally clear. The doctrine of the clarity of Scripture says that it is entirely clear enough for all that Scripture claims to do to prepare us for life and death, to explain who Jesus is and what the gospel is, to train us toward God and eternity, and so on, so on, so on. But that does not deny that there are some parts of the scripture that are more obscure than other parts, sometimes because they show up only once. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, I mentioned earlier, um, talks about the resurrection um, from, f f for the dead. Um, the baptism, rather, for the dead. Um, it only shows up once. It's hard to be absolutely sure what, 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 what it means because it does only show up once. But that's also saying, in effect, that Scripture makes it clear that the baptism for the dead is not a subject of huge importance. It's, it only does show up once. Whereas the cross is something of huge importance. Scripture makes that clear, not only because it says so, but but by the frequency with which it's, it's taught. Uh, it's, it's mirrored already in Passover in the Old Testament and in Yom Kippur and, 
the, the sacrifice of Isaac and, and so on. And in, in the New Testament, the Gospels, some have said, are really passion narratives with extensive introductions. Uh, the centrality of, of Christ is, and his cross work is absolutely everywhere. And you read in Paul, I determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified and, 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 and so on. So the scripture is teaching us what's most important, not denying that some things are less important. So uh, you, you, you must be aware of, of what the, the, the Claditas Scripture is not claiming. It's not claiming that anybody with any IQ whatsoever can understand any passage in Scripture whatsoever with perfect clarity. It, it's, it's not claiming that. So still related to that, you touched on this uh, in your lecture. Um, if we, uh, let me summarize this question. If we're preaching long enough, we probably uh, will preach a passage more than once. And uh, what to do if uh, later on we've come to a different understanding of uh, the passage uh, in our preaching ministry? Yeah, any comments on that? Well, if you've come to a different understanding and it's, you know, you're in a different church, you're 35 years farther down the road, you're in a different church, nobody in your church has heard you the first time. Um, I think my church can't remember what I said two yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> But if, if instead, uh, it's, it's like the situation that I found myself in uh, some years ago in Vancouver, uh, where it was just months down the road uh, I, that I, I got greater clarity on what a passage meant, then I, I have no difficulty whatsoever saying I was wrong before because I want people to see that I'm under the authority of Scripture rather than standing in judgment over it. Um, when you come to, to a passage of Scripture, that you preach several times. George Whitfield, one of the greatest preachers, one of the greatest gospel preachers, this side of the Apostle Paul, is said to have preached John 3, you must be born again, something like 3,000 times. Now he lived in the age before the internet. <laughs> Here I am preaching to a KVBC and you know, in three weeks, four weeks, I'm preaching at a large missions conference in, in Northern Ireland. And I guarantee somebody there will come up to me and say, yeah, we heard you at KVBC. <laughs> Were you there? No, 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 we got it online. You see? So there's no way that I can preach 3,000 times from John 3.16 without s somebody picking me up on it somewhere. Do you, do you, do you, do you see? Um, he, in fact, eventually, I mean, he'd get on his horse and ride five miles down the road to the next village and set up his little platform and, 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 and start preaching. And nobody there would have heard him from the place five, and nobody was there with a cell phone. And, and, so, so, but, but eventually somebody twigged about how often he was preaching from John 3 and, and said, Mr. Whitfield, Always we hear you preach, you must be born again. Everywhere you go, you must be born again. You preach you must be born again in New Hampshire. You preach you must be born again in New York. Everywhere it's you, you must be born again. Why do you preach so much on you must be born again? Because, he said, you must be born again. <laughs> <laughs> but more broadly, if, if you preach in different contexts, in part, you will shape your sermon by whether you're preaching primarily evangelistically or preaching to an established congregation of elderly saints, all of whom are converted as far as you can tell. You might handle the text just a little bit differently. So if you preach the same book several years down the road and you've changed a bit, you've got a different congregation, a different age, a different profile, even though your genuine, your general points and so on will be the same if you handle the text well, it, the sermon will get reshaped. I know a preacher in London, I don't do this myself, I'm not even sure it's wise, but I admire the man for it. He's 93 or 94 now, his name is Dick Lucas. His practice all his life has been he keeps working on his sermon, working on his sermon, working on his sermon, rewriting his notes, rewriting his outline, reshaping things right to the very end until he steps into the pulpit. And after he's finished the sermon, he tears up his notes. Even if he knows he's going to 
re-preach that sermon in five days in another town. He tears up his notes because he is so determined to be fresh in his encounter and interaction with Holy Scripture that, that he tears up his notes so he's not domesticated by what he's, what he's done in the past. Now, I don't do that. <laughs> I, I'm not courageous enough. But, but I admire the man for it because he's, he's trying to be fresh. Do you, do, 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 you, do you see? And moreover, um, when you preach a book, you can decide to preach 10 chapters in 10 sermons. Uh, in the evening sessions here, I'm doing three, three, three chapters in, in three sessions. One session for eight, one session for nine, one session for 1 Corinthians 10. But believe me, there's enough material in those chapters that I could take 10 sermons for three chapters. Or if my name were Martin Lloyd-Jones, I could take three years for three chapters. <laughs> and, and there's no absolutely right way or wrong way of, of how to divide up a passage, do you see? So you might divide things up a bit differently in another, another kind of sermon. So because I personally am persuaded that one of the things that's missing from some sermons is following the flow of the passage, I like a substantial chunk so that I'm forced to show people the flow of the argument. In, in, in a chunk of scripture, do you see? So they're learning to read the Bible better. But at the end of the day, I fully acknowledge that the four points I made last night from four paragraphs working the way through 1 Corinthians 9, I could have easily broken up into four sermons. Do, do, do you see? So coming back does not mean that you're rewriting your sermon or, 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 or correcting the sermon. It, it, it means that at the end of the day, you're still while trying to be shaped by Holy Scripture, um, at the end of the day, there's a fresh interaction between you, the interpreter, and the Word of God in which you bow in submission to what God says. Thank you. I guess this next question might concern uh, affirming both the uh, form and the uh, substance of Scripture. Uh, how do we discern if psalmist declaration observations about God, life, are propositionally and objectively true? Example, God has knitted our bodies in our mother's womb or in sin did my mother conceive me. And what about Job's pronouncements about God, which we know some to be true and not, some who, which aren't? Well, the only way you know is from the context. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. Hmm. There's no reason whatsoever for doubting that David is telling the truth, even if some of the language is phenomenological in Psalm 139 when he talks about how he's made in his mother's womb. There's no, no reason whatsoever. Whereas some of the things that Job says, well, basically, a lot of what he says is true because, because God says that it's so. He says, Job has spoken rightly of me, God says at the end of the chapters. Now, the, the, what's wrong in Job's, in Job's uh, speeches is that what, what he says eventually gets him to the place where he's, He's, he's questioning God's goodness. He actually goes so far that he says he wishes he had a, he wishes he had a lawyer to talk to God. He, you're pretty far gone when you need a lawyer to talk to God. You know? and, 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 and so, again, you cannot understand the individual utterances of Job with their overtones and associations and uh, signs of rebellion and, and, and contentment and, and, until, you, and, until you read the book. The, the, the book is the context. It's, it's cast as, uh, as an epic, you, you know? And so you hear some magnificent, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's also Job, do you, do you see? And, and so, so the, the book uh, uh, breeds an authenticity in, in, the, in the way you, you speak of God. Uh, but it's the genre itself and the context that that gives you the right to interpret a text a certain kind of way rather than in a mechanical fashion. Thank you. The next questions are concerning preaching or the preacher. Uh, first question, was Jesus an expository preacher? Any comments on his preaching? <laughs> How would you rate Jesus' preaching? The, how do you rate was your ad right, was wasn't it? <laughs> It's not the original question. No. Bad marks. <laughs> well, I don't think you can answer the question accurately until you have a good definition of what expository preaching is. Expository preaching is in the first 
instance, that which exposes the text you're dealing with. Expository preaching is nothing more than unpacking the text or texts you're dealing with. That's all it is. You see, there is a kind of preaching which claims to be expository, which works its way through a text in some sense, but it, it's actually picking up a little jewel here and a little jewel there, and sort of strings the jewels along like, like pearls on a string, but you still don't understand what the text means, what, what the flow of the argument is, what the flow is. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's bitty, it's, it's picky, and even if you're saying things that are true about this little phrase or that little phrase, you, you, you're not following what the text means. So expository preaching is not necessarily preaching of only half a verse at a time, or expository preaching where you must have at least a chapter at a time. Uh, expository preaching is not even a situation where you only have one chapter to refer to or one text to refer to. You might, in an expository sermon, choose two texts and work through both of them. Yeah, you, you might. What expository preaching is at its heart is an expounding of what the scripture texts you're dealing with actually say. So that at the end of the day, the people who are listening to you are learning what the Bible says. That's the way to evaluate a sermon. Is it really unpacking what the Bible says? It may be done well, it may be done badly, maybe too technical, maybe too, a bit silly, maybe a bit clunky and all. But the real test of it, the thing that you want to rate, first of all, is whether it unpacks what Holy Scripture says. So, when you come to Jesus preaching, you want to ask, when he handles Old Testament Scripture, is he unpacking what the text is saying? And I would argue, in fact, I have argued elsewhere, that Jesus is the most amazing expository preacher. Because he brings out things that are there in the text that we sometimes overlook, but they really are there once you understand how the texts work and operate, and how they work in, in typological fashion and foreign, and so on. So, so for, for, uh, part of the problem, of course, is that a lot of what Jesus does is not, um, is not provide a sermon, uh, but, but a, a brief exposition of scripture in terms of his interaction with other people. So to take one very simple example, here's Jesus in uh, uh, Matthew 22 uh, during Holy Week. Uh, he's interacting with the scribes and the Pharisees. He's at the temple and, 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 and so on. Um, so chapter 21, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king and you've got two passages from the Old Testament, Zechariah and Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, and J Jesus indicates the significance of all of that. And then, then his authority is being questioned until you come to the end of, um, of, of, of 21. Um, Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Well, he links together two or three of the so-called stone testimonia, Old Testament passages from Isaiah, from Psalm 118, which speak of the coming Messiah as, as a stone that crushes opponents uh, even while it becomes the cornerstone. Does he understand those texts? Well, yes, I, I, I'm sure he does. And in the next chapter, um, 22 at the end, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Well, that's from Psalm 110. That chapter is quoted more often than any other Old Testament chapter. It's hugely messianic. But how you get there depends on how, how you understand the Melchizedek line of typology that runs from Genesis 14 to Psalm 110 to Hebrews 7. And Jesus is part of that chain. It's, it's exactly right, it's, it's brilliant. It would just take me too long to unpack it. Uh, 
I have a sermon on it somewhere, uh, Getting Excited About Melchizedek, I think it's called. Um, you can probably find it online pretty, pretty fast. And you'll, you'll see that what he's doing is unpacking scripture. Now, sometimes what he's doing is not directly unpacking scripture, one particular passage, but he is unpacking the great movements of scripture. For example, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he alludes to or quotes scripture several times, but what is really important is after the Beatitudes, which is part of the introduction, and the salt and light metaphors, then he begins the great body of the text. And he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And he explains what he means by that. And then he takes the six antitheses. You have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. What he's showing is what it means to say that he fulfills the scripture. He is explaining how he, in, how he interacts with, with, with the scripture. You see, he, he, he's unpacking holy scripture in that particular means as well. And so I, I, I would say that, uh, that Jesus uh, is a remarkable expositor. Actually, what you just said uh, is a helpful point to jump into the next question. So when expounding a text, how useful it is to use other parallel passages? For example, when preaching on Mark's gospel, bringing other synoptic parallels to shed light, will this end up diluting the text? Perhaps Mark had reasons not to include them in the first place. The synoptic gospels are a peculiar uh, uh, situation. Um, because when people first read Mark or Matthew or Luke, they weren't busily hunting up the, 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 the parallel passages. They didn't have them. The, the book circulated independently first. Do, 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 do you see? So to get the thrust of Mark, you want to be able to read Mark without citing all the time uh, what Matthew says or what Luke contributes on the same point. On the other hand, it depends what you're trying to emphasize. Uh, you are still expounding scripture uh, when, on the one hand, you expound just Mark or just Matthew. You're expounding scripture. You're explaining what scripture actually says. But if, you're, but if you draw attention to the fact that Matthew adds this and this and this as well, and it's worth thinking about that complementary insight, you're still explaining scripture. Um, you, you're, you're unpacking it. You're showing what's there. It's just that now you're, you've got two texts that you're un unpacking. What's a mistake is to explain Mark and, um, and, and, and give an explanation of it that is really not in Mark, that is only in Matthew, where you, you, you've read Mark and you, you claim you're preaching Mark, but in point of fact, what's in mind is the parallel passage in Matthew which says something a, a bit different, I mean, complementary, but a bit different, then I think that's a mistake because you're not tell, teaching people how to read their Bibles well. Um, w what I would say is that some people who have been taught um, expository preaching at the beginning uh, with a huge emphasis on explaining what's there in the text, explaining what's there in the text, explaining what's there in the text, actually begin to make a mistake after a while in my view. That is, they can explain so much what's there in their particular text that Sunday morning that they don't take the time to explain how that text is related to the book or to the corpus or to the canon. Now you don't want to do this every Sunday, but I would argue that one of the things a good expositor does is not only explain the immediate text, but to show how that immediate text is related to the great booming biblical theological connections that run all the way through scripture and bring you to the Lord Jesus. I sometimes give a lecture on the nature of expository preaching and, and um, I have five elements in my definition of expository preaching that I, I won't give you here, would, would t t take you t too far away. But all of them have to do with, with the fact that, that uh, uh, the, the preacher is trying to unpack what's there in the text. But the fifth element that I, that, that I throw into the defi de definition of expository preaching, it is preaching which seeks out the tendons, the ligaments that run through scripture from the text all the way to the Lord Jesus. Mm. You, you, you see, um, you, you learn how to do that with time. Otherwise, you can preach through huge chunks of Jeremiah and huge chunks of the Psalms and so on. And, and because you're sticking closely to the text, you actually never get to Jesus. Mm. 
or, or else you, the most you say is something like, um, well, that's been very interesting. And that's just like Jesus, isn't it? And then you jump to Jesus that way. It's, a, it's an argument by analogy, you know? Um, <laughs> you heard the old joke about, uh, about uh, the, the, the Sunday school lad um, who, who's addressed by the pastor. The pastor's decided to come and talk to the little kids. And, and this works in North America, but you'll get the idea very, very quickly. And, the, and the, the, the pastor is not very good talking with little kids. I mean, he's okay with adults, but kids are outside of his bailiwick. And, um, I mean, he's trying to be engaging and warm and insightful. And he, he says, children, I'm, I'm thinking of a, a little animal. It's not very big. has a large, bushy tail. In our country, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's usually gray in color. Some places in the world, it's red. Uh, it likes nuts. Runs up and down trees very fast. What, what, what's, what sort of animal am I thinking of? Uh, thinking of? And kids look at him, bored. <laughs> what planet is this guy from? <laughs> find, eventually, one kid puts up his hand and says, please, sir, I know that the right answer is Jesus. It always is. <laughs> but it sure sounds to me like a squirrel. <laughs> So I, I, I worry about sermons which always give you the right answer is Jesus, where it's not quite clear how you move from the text to Jesus. You know oh, this reminds me, it just sounds like Jesus. Another squirrel falls to the ground dead. So, so, so I'm sure that one of the things that expository preaching ideally does is learn to identify the, the great biblical theological tendons that run through Scripture. So that if, 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 if your text from Jeremiah is, is talking about the temple or something like that, then you've just butted up against one of the great biblical, biblical theological tendons that run all the way through to Jesus as the temple of God, or, or to the new heaven and the new earth, uh, in the city built like a cube. The only cube in the Old Testament is the most holy place it, in, in the temple. You, you, you see, it's, at some point it's worth taking a small excursus to unpack the, the biblical theological storylines to show how your passage is related to other passages, do you see? Now you don't do that all the time. If you do it all the time, all you do is you're, you're becoming a topical preacher. But to reserve some place for it, you know, it's, it's part of explaining how the Bible works, what the Bible says. The aim of expository preaching is not to have a, a, a one-size-fits-all package of how big the text is, but what you're doing to explain what Holy Scripture says. John, any quick resources that comes to your mind that can help us uh, for, as we're preparing a passage to do things like that? Oh, boy. Um, Start with the Zondervan Study Bible. <laughs> oh, the Zondervan Study Bible. <laughs> um, I hate to become a, a peddler, but, but I edited a, a study Bible that has a lot of biblical theology built right into it. And at the end, there are about 40 ex, uh, ex, uh, essays at the end which, which trace out some of those biblical theological themes on, on temple and judgment and hope and priesthood and so on. And so that can help you. If you're a little more advanced and, and you, 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 you want to see how biblical theology works a little better, I want to sound like a peddler again. Um, I, I edit a series called NSBT, New Studies in Biblical Theology. Uh, volume 50 is about to appear. Uh, we produce about three volumes a year, so you can guess how long I've been working at it. And, um, and, and it's been written by many, many people, but we're, it's emphasizing the, how to read the Bible altogether. And I know many, many preachers who buy all of the volumes in that series and just keep digging away at them. It shows them how the Bible is put together in biblical theological slices. Um. Mm. Thank you. Uh, so we are getting out of time, so we just finish up with two other questions. Um, preaching and teaching takes a lot of time to prepare. How can we rest in God's power and purposes? Oftentimes, we may suffer burnout in ministry because we may, be, we may be asked to preach every week. Every week? My word. When I first started as a full-time minister, I was part-time for 
quite a number of years first. When I first became pastor of a church on my own, the minimum number of times I spoke a week was five. Mm. And on a heavy week, it was 13. Mm. I think we have false expectations. One of the things that I did to make sure that I didn't lose a cutting thrust. Instead of saying, okay, I've got five presentations. Now, two were in front of the whole church. One was a prayer meeting, one was a Sunday school class, and one was something else, I forgot what it was. And, and, and I, would not, I would not say, I've got a total of um, 25 hours, 27 hours that I can devote to sermon preparation this week when I add in hospital visitation and counseling and all the rest. Um, 27 hours, divide by five, that's, you know, five hours and a bit that I can devote to each one in preparation. I never did that. If, if I had a total of 25 hours to devote to five preparations, I would do 15 to 20 hours for one of them. Even if that meant that I had only one to two hours for the others. The reason was, because I wanted at least one sermon a week where I was still using my Greek and Hebrew, taking time to read commentaries, biblical theology, and so on. At least with one of them, I was working hard to keep the tool sharp, to do extra depth reading, and so on. Do you, do you see? I think that's a wise decision. And that didn't necessarily mean that that sermon was better. It just meant that on the long haul, it was part of the discipline of having of having tool sharp and reading seriously rather than finding the first little homiletical aid to crank out something else quickly. Do you, do you, do you, do you see? Now, if you, people have different capacity for work, different efficiencies. Uh, if you have, preach only once a week, thank God that you only got once a week and devote your hours uh, of preparation time. Uh, I'll give you another little hint in that regard. Most good preachers I know, if you ask them, what's the percentage of time you devote to understanding the text over against outlining it, making it sing and sting, applying it, um, getting an outline for a sermon, what, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the division? How much do you give to part one and how much do you give to part two? The reality is that there are a lot of expositors who devote something like 80, 85, 90% to understanding what the text says. And then when it comes to application or structure and so on, um, if, you have, if you have 10% or 15%, you're, you're being generous, which means that often their applications sound like, and may the Lord bless his word to our hearts which doesn't have a whale of a lot of bite, to be quite frank, do you, do, 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 do you see? Whereas the preachers that I've got to know over the years who have been most telling, who are biblically faithful, but at the same time know how to make a text sing and sting, wound and heal, it's a 50-50 division. So you set aside the time for understanding the text and understanding it well. Once you've done your 50% of your hour, move on, because the most the most demanding intellectual part of sermon preparation is not understanding a text. I mean, if you've had a seminary training, if you haven't, it's a bit different. The proportions would have to be a bit, if, if, if you've never had any seminary training, probably you need to put 70 or 80% into understanding the text. But if, if, if you had seminary, you know how to do exegesis, you know how to read the Greek text, you know how to read a commentary, you, you, you know how to do all of that. So you, you can crank out what a text understands, how you understand a text and what it means. You can crank that out pretty fast. You're scratchy notes, you've got it all there. Um, but figuring out how to put it together in a structure, in something that's memorable, that relates to this age, that challenges people, that remembers the different sectors of your congregation, how old they are, oh, you know. You, you hear a lot of young pastors and all of their illustrations have to do with babies <laughs> and children and because that's where they are in their life. And, and, and some, I can think of one old pastor, he's dead now, he knows better, but, um, <laughs> but toward the end of his life, every single sermon had to do with death. <laughs> and I couldn't help thinking, I know why you've chosen their topic. <laughs> 
do you, do you see? Whereas a good preacher is, is, is projecting himself into all the different sectors of the, of, of the congregation, men and women and mothers and widows and uh, people who've just lost their job and high-flying executives and so on, and, and choosing illustrations that are diverse and so on. That takes imagination and time and thought and care and prayer. And, 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 and so, uh, again, what, what I'd want to say is, uh, is, is there's, there's not a formula on how you divide up your hours, but there, there are some priorities that you, 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 can, you can preserve. And one priority is if you're preaching too many times a week, um, don't necessarily quit, but preserve at least one of them for most of your study time so you keep your tools fresh. And number two, make sure that you uh, spend a sufficient amount of time in your sermon preparation hours to making a text sing and sting and, and hang together as a, as a text rather than simply uh, uh, just unpacking what it means. Yes, thank you. Uh, I remember also uh, David Jackman uh, has a practical advice oh, on yes. this. Uh, so if you have 16 hours, don't plan for a 16 hour stretch. Break it up into say four or five sections of a few hours each. I found that to be helpful as well. It's hugely helpful, especially if it's stretched over two or three or four days, mm -hmm. because your 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 subconscious, your 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 mind, when you're falling asleep, when you're driving, and you're at a stoplight, and so on, you're still churning these things over in your mind, you know, and that's that's really helpful. Uh, one final question, and uh, we need to after that move on to your exposition. Um, from a practical aspect. What loving and wise actions can be taken to provide helpful and constructive feedback to preachers, speakers who may have explicitly err on going out of context or have undermined the authority of scripture by coming off being not confident or treating it trivially by making inappropriate jokes or perhaps to voice out to leadership about these concerns without appearing judgmental or unnecessarily critical to the leadership selection of preachers, speakers? Well, if you're someone in the congregation, especially if you're 20 years younger than the preacher, say nothing and pray. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're just a smart mouth. You know, you, know, you don't have the right to go uh, around and destroy a man's ministry just because you've taken a few courses in homiletics. Know? Now it's a bit different if it's the other way around. If you're the senior man, uh, senior minister of a church, and you've got some guy who's 25 who's just starting out, and he's doing all sorts of things wrong, then then it's your job, it's your responsibility to mentor him and offer encouragement. That was a fine effort this morning. I really appreciated this or that. I do have one or two things you might want to work on, and then don't dump the whole 25 points of criticism. Uh, just just work on one for a week or two and. And then so on. so so it's it's not just a how do you change things generically, but but, but there's the dynamic of relationships. Uh, it, it it might be you'll be able to get a, a small team of three or four guys from different churches together where they're criticizing one another. That that's that's really the secret behind Proc Trust and Simeon Trust stuff. You know where you're you're, get, you're getting mutual criticism. Uh, that that's that's really helpful too. But if it's a generic question, how do I? Uh, in my church, uh, uh, usefully criticize my senior minister um, for all the reasons you've just indicated. Um, um, if, if the I is himself about 20 years old and the, the, the potential critic E um, is, is, uh, is, is 55 or 60, uh, hold your peace. Um, be, be thoughtful, be quiet, be respectful. Uh, thank him where you can thank him. Uh, exercise the gift of encouragement. Thank you, thank you. Um, I apologize for the questions, uh, various questions that didn't get to be answered, but uh, uh, Don has very kindly agreed that after the conclusion of the session, he's able to stay back for a few minutes. Uh, if you'd like to come up and ask him your questions personally, he's happy to respond for that uh, for a short while. Okay, so we'll... Uh, uh, thank Don again for answering these questions. Is there a five minute break or anything? Is uh, there a five minute break? Would you like a five minute break? Well, if people would want to use the loo or something. Or yep. Um, I think we legs. can. Yeah, I think we can take a very quick uh, toilet break. And then after that, we will continue with Bible reading and uh, exposition to conclude our session together. <laughs>